Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Every week I have this privilege to join you for a moment to, uh, uh, together we hear the journeys of men and women who, uh, desiring to follow our Lord Jesus more closely, are drawn deeper to Him and to His church, uh, many, in, many in ways that they never anticipated. Uh, but they're here to share their joy of discovering the fullness of the faith. And such as uh, our case tonight, Paul McCusker, a uh, former Baptist and former Anglican, is joining us. Well, first, Paul, welcome to the program. Thank you. I, I thought I might ask you, as so often is the case, uh, Paul is an author and a uh, quite successful author, uh, which is, is it's a privilege to have you here with well, me just you. for that, you know, besides you. the fact that you, that we're Christian brothers here, but uh, maybe mention to the audience, they may not all of them remember your, or recognize your name right off, but they re might recognize a lot that you've been involved with. Well, I'm, I'm sort of a prolific anonymous author because of <laughs> it's, it's not so much about my name as what I work with. And right. uh, one thing, maybe Adventures in Odyssey, a kids radio program produced with Focus on the Family. I've been working on that since the beginning. Uh, 26, 27 years, of course. Oh. I started oh. when I was 12. And um, <laughs> uh, the Focus on the Family Radio Theater program and, and then uh, spin-off novels from a lot of those things and then my own novels under my own name. But, well, uh, the, the book that you laid in front of me as we uh, met today was the, an annotated version of the Screwtape Letters by yes. C.S. Lewis. We've done a lot of work with the Lewis estate on C.S. Lewis's work for audio drama and then that led to the uh, led to the annotated screw tape letters, which I'm very pleased to uh, have excited. out. I, I almost wish we could just spend the whole program talking about that stuff, but mm -hmm. uh, maybe another program okay. will do that. <laughs> because today, uh, what we'd like to do is to, is to talk more about your spiritual journey, mm -hmm. which I'm sure not only was affected by your writings, but but, but carried out in your writings mm -hmm. as it flowed off into what you were writing. But what I generally do in the program is get out of the way as soon as I can mm. and invite you to go way back and uh, let us hear a little bit of uh, how your spiritual journey began. Well, it, um, it began with, um, uh, I should say that there, there's no point where I didn't believe in God. Uh, someone asked me that once and I, there, uh, from an early age, mm. I always believed in God and strangely that God cared for me. I wasn't deserving of that. but was always aware of him and believed that he loved me. From the family environment? From the very beginning, and I think that came from the family environment. Now, my family environment, in terms of background, was I had, uh, my father was Catholic, and his family were Catholic, but I, I would say that he was more cultural Catholic, okay. not as a matter of faith, but just sort of a matter of upbringing. It wasn't, I never perceived that it was real to him. Uh, now, my mom uh, was Methodist, uh, primarily, but she raised us more, I want to say, interdenominational, uh, definitely Protestant. But I remember, I think I was christened in a Methodist church and then uh, went to Presbyterian at various times and different sorts, and then settled on the uh, Baptist church when we moved to Bowie, Maryland. <laughs> and, uh, and even then, it wasn't just one Baptist church. It always seemed to depend on whether she was getting fed up with the length of the sermon. So we might switch from one <laughs> Baptist to another Baptist church. But my formative years were Baptist, uh, I think. And my mom was determined that we would go to church. We went every Sunday. We would go to Sunday school and vacation Bible school. So that was a big part of my early upbringing. But a part of your consciousness, as far as you can remember, was, yes. the, was the reality of God. Yes. It was never a point. I just don't remember ever suffering doubt about that. An I intimacy with God? Uh, well, sort of. I mean, it's funny. My mom, I was remembering recently that uh, even as a young man, people would came to me and ask me to pray for things because <laughs> their perception was that if I prayed for something, and this was when I was five, six, seven years old, that I'd get it. Well, that was only because, you know, I prayed for a rabbit and it showed up on the doorstep the next day. It was a wild rabbit that had come in from the woods. Or I prayed for a turtle and it showed up. And to my youth, my being five, six, seven years old, it just followed. But I got a reaction from my family to that that even to this day kind of puzzles me. But I, I wouldn't say that that was exceptional. In this, it was just my relationship with God was sort of always there. It was an, part of my assumed reality, I suppose is the best way to put it. And, um, and then I, in going to church, in terms of deeper meaning, um, 
it was through a novel, actually, that everything I'd been learning in church suddenly came together, and it was the greatest story ever told by oh, Fulton Orsler, yep, yep, which of course, yep, Catholic yep, yep. author, which I wouldn't have known at the time. Yep. And, uh, and I remember distinctly reading that, getting to the point of the crucifixion, and uh, realizing in that moment, I was sixth grade maybe, uh, suddenly thinking, he did this for me. This was for me. And it's like all the church and Sunday school and everything came together in that moment. And I, I knelt in my bedroom by myself and said, God, forgive me. And now I've, I've later thought of that as sort of that moment when I acknowledged Jesus as my Savior. But turning that into behavior or reality in my life was still, well, I do that at church. Uh, and it was a couple of years later that I, um, there was this kid at school, I was eighth grade, and he was going around passing out tracks and he was witnessing to people. And I actually found it embarrassing. I thought, this is for church, he's putting people off, they're getting really annoyed with him. And so I presumed to sit down with him at lunch one day and tell him, look, you know, church is church, school is school. You're just being, kind. people think you're weird. And he was very kind. He took that very graciously and he had his Bible and he opened his Bible and he said, well, let me show you. And he talked about preaching the gospel and about sharing the faith. And he hit me with all of this stuff. And I realized there was more going on than what I had been experiencing. Um, uh, it was not as real until that moment. <laughs> And over the next few months, then, I kind of moved into taking Christianity seriously. You said this was high school? This was eighth grade. Eighth grade. So I'm oh, in junior high. Wow, wow. And, uh, but it became, it meant, it clicked. Mm -hmm. and, and he just had the Bible. And I believed in the Bible enough as a good Baptist boy to understand the significance of that. So over the next few months, I, I turned significantly in, in terms of mm -hmm. moving from the Savior to is being Lord, to wanting to be a disciple and to follow Him uh, truly. And, uh, and the good news to that is that I had the desire. The downside, uh, I realized later, was that I, um, this was the early days of the Jesus movement, okay, Jesus freaks, back before DC Talk dealt with it in the 90s. And, um, and the good news was that the enthusiasm was there, the passion was there, the desire was there. The downside was that in becoming this sort of Jesus freak, I detached from the church right. completely. Um, I, I would still go, but I would only go to be sort of a thorn in the flesh to complain about all the things the church wasn't. You know, my Baptist church was not following, it was not being like the early church, you know, as if I had any clue what the early church was. And uh, so it was about me. And I think yeah. that was that moment when I realized I could have a relationship with Christ it was about me and him alone, outside of anything resembling community. And um, I was going to say that period of my own awakening. Right. Uh, for me, it was in the early '70s uh, during college. Uh, but very much you're talking about. The part of that was, why did I discover this now? Why didn't the church tell me this? Mm -hmm. And so it became this break from this uh, system that never told me this stuff, right. even though I discovered later they were. It was not, I just wasn't listening. Right. But so you're, there's a kind of a blaming of parents, a blaming of the institution, a blaming of that. Mm -hmm. But now I have found the great, uh, the pearl of great price, and so it's mine. It's mine. Right. It's my precious. You know. Yeah, it's the are. accusation you failed in your job. Yeah. I'm going to get it right yeah. now. And with that comes a certain spiritual pride and arrogance. In fact, the lesson later for me was that that danger of saying, I'm actually better than the community. I am better off on my own than mm -hmm. in community with other believers because they're a bunch of hypocrites or they get it wrong or they're not following Jesus the way I think they ought to be following yeah. Jesus. And I, I had that period for a couple of years, and it, I think it's the arrogance of youth, it's all the things that 8th, ninth grade into high school, I, you just do. It's all yeah. part and parcel, whether it's spiritual or whether it's something else, it was tied up together. Although, and this is a book that needs to be written, although I do believe historically that it was a, it was a phenomenon that was happening in the late 60s and early 70s for mm -hmm. a lot of people that had this awakening, the Jesus movement, 
um, or, or whether are directly a part of it or not, but the point was, and then it involved at that age, you know, teenagers, young 20s having this awakening, a rejecting of, of the parents' faith and all that, that these are now the mature pastors of these independent megachurches right. that have institutionalized that phenomenon mm -hmm. that you and I talk about, right. but now it's the institutionalized, independent, Jesus and me, radical movement well, spreading Well, it's the everywhere. ultimate extreme of that, which I, I think is, again, the heart of it is great, the passion, all right. of the things that go with it. But the danger then is becomes individualistic to the exclusion of, of the community that Scripture talks yeah. about and that we need to be uh, be part of. Uh, so, but I actually, by the grace of God, hit a turning point, and I'm not, I'm not. I wish I could be clear when it was, but at some point I did realize the importance of the church. Mm -hmm. I realized my Baptist church, and I would have thought of it in a very local, individual assembly uh, reality, as opposed to anything bigger than that. Uh, but I became very involved then. I moved kind of from that individualistic into community. And my formative years truly were spent uh, as a Baptist in this individual church. And uh, I got involved, deeply involved, and that's where I, I actually was able to begin to write. Uh, my my um, church was very arts minded, which you don't expect from a Baptist church. Uh, but right. in fact, we were doing music, youth musicals in the early 70s, which of course would sound like Muzak now. But we had drums and guitars <laughs> yeah. and everything. And I even remember hearing a rumor that our association wanted to throw us out for doing it. So um, that gave me a chance to use my talents and gifts. And that drew me in. And so really for the next, well, uh, decade or so. I identified myself as a Baptist. I fit in with that and, and was part of that community. And so that was great. And I, I love that period. And, and it taught me love of Scripture, love of Jesus, uh, to be a disciple, to follow Him in the context of the church and not by myself. Our guest tonight is uh, Paul McCusker. Just remind you of that. Uh, during this whole time where you're having a, a deepening awakening to Jesus, not just as Savior, but as truly Lord of your life. Mm -hmm. Of course, the, I think the danger of this individualism is, well, what does it mean that he's Lord and, and what areas mm -hmm. and how do we live that out? That's the problem with the individualism. Was there a place in there for the Catholic Church at all during that whole period? Your, your dad was kind of a nominal Catholic. Right. But Not what, really. In fact, what was your sense of that or was it just one other church? The, the uh, it was, I wouldn't even, I'm, I, it's funny because uh, fortunately, my church didn't do a lot of Catholic bashing like some right. Baptist churches might do. And so I don't remember a lot of sermons or anything. It, they were sort of just that other group. Okay. Uh, I knew Catholics. They did things in their church I didn't understand. They may or may not have been Christian. I mean, by, by implication, the suggestion was, well, they're following all these man-made rules. They may or may not even be saved because they may or may not even know Jesus or love Him. And so there was, there was that sense of but maybe they're misguided, maybe they are or they aren't. They, but they weren't that relevant. Though as I got more evangelistic, okay. if I encountered a Catholic, then I might feel compelled to lead them to Jesus with the assumption that they couldn't possibly know Him. So that was the reality of the Catholic Church for me. It was sort of there, but not really. Of course, being evangelistic, meant handing out chick tracks. Yes. Now the chick tracks, the little comic book tracks, were, were great and I used them a lot. Uh, but then they had, of course, some very anti-Catholic right. uh, aspects to them that uh, I was aware of but didn't fully embrace. So it was a non-reality to me, some foreign thing that wasn't part of my Christian experience. Right. So that side of it, uh, which is why even coming near the Catholic Church is, was such a shock for a lot of people who knew me <laughs> from that period of my life. Right. Um, but everything, it's, it's funny how God shapes things because um, a number of things happened as I was, went into college, came out of college, was moving into my work life and looking at my future in Bowie, Maryland at this Baptist Church. And then suddenly the rug got pulled out from under me in many ways. Uh, just at the point when I had made the decision that I thought God was calling me to be a writer, and that I would probably do that writing in the context of this church in this town and get married and live out my life there. Uh, within six months, 
everything changed. Mm. Um, my father, who had, my mother and father had divorced when I was younger, and he had moved to Denver and just got himself into a lot of trouble with alcohol and just different things, and he committed suicide. So oh, that was oh. January of 1985. And uh, the shock of that and everything that follows on from that kind of experience and disruption, painful disruption, sort of changes everything anyway. And, uh, and I remember a friend saying, I just don't envy you this time of your life because now everything's up for grabs. And I was not cognizant that anything was going to really change, but then it did. And over the next few months, the job that I had, that I figured would be my tent making while I'm doing my work at the church, uh, they were bought out by a New York company and suddenly I was out of a job. And uh, only through the encouragement of a good friend in California, Chuck Bolte, and I mentioned his name because Adventures and Odyssey fans will know that name. Uh, Chuck suggested that I come to California and work with a ministry there that was doing a lot of arts things. And so I moved to California. And that was huge mm. because it pulled me out of my context of family and of this church. And California is a different world anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and so I wound up in California where I worked for this ministry, which led me to work with Focus on the Family and Adventures and Odyssey. I met my wife. Uh, when I left Maryland uh, to go out, my mom said, you're going to go out and marry this California girl and we'll never see you again. And I fooled her. I married an English girl that I met in California and then moved to Colorado. Um, but with that, we went into a period that was um, a, kind of a wandering for me. I couldn't replicate my church experience there. And so I wound up going to non-denominational churches. And this was during the heyday of, of the seeker movement was beginning to come up. Okay. And churches were working very hard to be anything like churches. They wanted to bring in people evangelistically. And that led me into this period of, of exploration because I couldn't quite get connected. I was involved in churches, but it was not clicking at a very deep level. I was thinking it might be good just to clarify to some in the audience who aren't familiar with the seeker, this yeah. whole seeker movement, which is, is really new. Uh, well, it came up and from a number of different influential sources in evangelical churches. Right. And it was sort of, to put it crudely, it was well-intentioned, meant to be evangelistic, to get people into church who wouldn't normally go there. Sort of marketing-driven. Yeah. And using all the latest marketing tricks to try to get people in, uh, whether it was entertainment or anything, anything you could do mm -hmm. to bring people in was seemed to be acceptable in that rise. Yeah, uh, well, one example of, of the change was I remember there used to be signs on on churches that would say, "If a circle with a line through it, meaning right. no food or drinks in the sanctuary," mm -hmm. where that became no coffee without a cover. Right. I mean, everything changed. <laughs> That's right. You, you know, in other words, it's it's whatever can make the person feel comfortable right. bringing their more comfortable environment into the church, and then we'll sneak the gospel in on them. I mean, mm -hmm. that became this whole secret. Well, and that was, it was stealth. And, and they even moved into auditoriums and, and right. high school gymnasiums, and, and the sacred spaces sort of went away because they didn't want it to look like church in any way, shape, or form. And Which would explain why someone that's trying to replicate this experience that you had, where is this anymore? Right. And that, that was the difficult thing. And my own sensibilities uh, were changing. And, and I, I remember there were two or three instances where I, I thought, okay, I don't know that I belong here anymore. I'm looking for something. I don't know what it is. In one case, it was a, a sermon enhancer that involved um, the California Raisins coming out in costume performing I Heard It Through the Grapevine. And clever as that is, I'm in what I think is supposed to be church. And I honestly was wondering, what, what is this? I remember another case of, of going, we had communion in another church. And because the sermon was about being fishers of men, uh, the communion was, uh, well, the grape juice, which it normally would be, and goldfish crackers. And my, my sense of, I want to say the sacred, my sense of yeah. reverence was, was 
sort of offended by this. I kept thinking there's got to be more mm. to what the church is than the latest marketing gimmicks. Mm. There has to be more to it. Uh, later I would use the word transcendent. At the time I wouldn't have even thought to use that word. But I kept thinking, but the church should be more transcendent mm. than this. But I don't know how. I had no point of reference for what that should look like or what, what I should be experiencing, except now it was a yearning. I began to think, what is church? What is it supposed to be? Is it really this? Is it like a spiritual 7-Eleven, really, mm -hmm. that you can kind of go into any one and it all is basically a lot of advertising and a lot of consumer um, approaches to Christ? So that was, that was a big problem for me at that point. It's, you know, I was thinking to some extent this isn't completely new in the sense that um, if you're if you're in a, a theology that's a once saved, always saved theology, it shapes the Sunday experience mm -hmm. to be all about there's somebody out there mm -hmm. that isn't saved yet. So the sermon is about saving that person right. and you know, raise your hand or come forward so that anyone else in that congregation that's already found Christ or has known Christ for years and years and years, the Sunday sermon is always about that other person. So where do they fit? Mm -hmm. So it, the theology runs and drives the whole experience. Right, and so, the seeker movement, even years later, did their own surveys and realized how it had fallen flat on, on basically feeding its own people. Yeah. That everything became evangelistic. And historically, I've been very curious about when that happened. Uh, the early church was not about right. that. It was about family. You had visitors, but it wasn't meant to be an evangelistic tool. And I'm, I'm wondering if it, it was a rise because of Dwight L. Moody and a, a whole emphasis, which, by the way, as you say, follows on naturally from one sensibility to, oh, but we must evangelize. In fact, we're yeah. failing if we don't evangelize. And now the church is a tool for that rather than a place of building up the believers. And, and so then it leads to all the extremes that go into, well, whatever it takes whatever we have to do to the building and to whatever, to be a living tract, uh, then let's do it. And that became problematic mm. for me. And I struggled. Uh, my wife and I, uh, by this time, it, we were married and Sundays would come and go and we just got tired of looking for a church where we could really connect. And I remember driving past a Catholic church and we were in Southern California. We drove past this church and I thought, there's something going on in there that's been going on for a very long time. And I don't know what it is, but let's stop in and look. And so we did, we pulled into the parking lot in time for this evening service and went in, just kind of crept into the back just to look. <laughs> and there was the church, which was done up with statues and all these unfamiliar things to me, things I'd heard Catholic churches were like, and I might've seen in a wedding or two. But we went in and I saw kind of statues and all this formal worship space. But the people there were all watching some a bunch of guys with acoustic guitars singing kind of Godspell wannabe songs. And I had an immediate, I'm, I'm, and I'm sure it's a completely <laughs> wrong impression, but I kind of went in and went, well, I can get this anywhere. And we turned around and walked out and I didn't think about it again. Um, so this, this four or five year period was this wilderness for me spiritually and in terms of what the church was meant to be. Which is interesting because what you're, what you're experiencing was a, was a struggle in the church mm -hmm. with the seeker, the need for the evangelization. So mm -hmm. what do we do? And you know, is there something wrong here? Maybe we need to change it. And, and so get torn between preserving that great right. wineskin at the same time of the new wine. How mm -hmm. do you put them together? That's right. always been, been the struggle. And the intention is always good. It's, right. it's like, well, how do we make this meaningful for people? But sometimes we wind up throwing the baby out with the bathwater because it's, it's a case of, we go, well, the latest marketing surveys tell us where we're losing people for these reasons. You just have to get on the other side of the liturgy or change the liturgy or get rid of the liturgy or whatever it takes to get them through the door. So did you immediately join RCIA? <laughs> <laughs> no. In fact, um, we, through a variety of circumstances, I was still working with Focus, and uh, my wife is English, and I fell in love with England, and uh, decided I would go freelance, and we were in a position at that time in our lives to go to England. 
Yeah. It's funny, my wife is, loves America, so she's begrudgingly <laughs> moving back to England with me. And so we go to England, and we were there, and again, we began the, let's look for a church, where can we go, what do we do? And um, uh, the short version is, we found this Anglican church that I later realized was would be called High Church for the most part, which means it's very Catholic, but I never would have known that. And uh, we went in to visit, because it just looked like there were a lot of cars there, there was something going on, and we went. And I went in and experienced, essentially, my first real taste of liturgy. And it was everything to me. It was like coming home. I came in, and it was completely unexpected. I never in my wildest dreams thought that what I might have been yearning for was a more transcendent experience that connects to liturgy, especially liturgy that goes way back through history in wording and phrasing and aspects to it that go even go back to the mm. early church. I mean, uh, writer Richard Foster has said that the thing about evangelicals is that, uh, I'll do a bad paraphrase, but it's basically all they know is there was this first century with the Bible and Jesus, and then this blip called the Reformation, and then Billy Graham. And that's all you need to know about history. And suddenly I go into a church where just in that liturgy I had a sense of history. And that not only fulfilled what I think I was looking for without knowing it, but then whetted my appetite to learn more. How do I go back beyond me and my Bible and the latest marketing gimmicks to what is truly transcendent? It is interesting to place side by side that experience in your first Catholic church on California where you have the uh, the traditional environment, mm -hmm. but you have the experimentation of trying to figure out how to make this quote relevant, mm -hmm. as opposed to probably a conservative Anglican church in England is a great hymn singing environment. Mm -hmm. The beauty of the Elizabethan uh, liturgy, uh, but but yet I, I remember my own seminary days of singing those great hymns. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a power there. Mm -hmm. And the liturgy from the prayer book itself, powerfully written, beautifully written. It's a fascinating juxtaposition of Europe during, yep. the, uh, during that Renaissance period where it was all about art in terms of pictures, of images, of statues, all of that. But in England, you don't have so much of that. You have words. That's the time of Shakespeare. The time of basically the prayer book being written and the beauty of that language is as someone who writes and loves the beauty of language it just it struck home yeah. to me but after going into that i then had to say well wait a minute what do they actually believe <laughs> we're going to pause there Paul, okay because <laughs> that's a good place to pause because there's, you know there's the there's what you see and what you experience and then wait what's it what's mm -hmm. at the core so we'll come back to that our guest is paul mccusker and we'll be with him in just a moment see you Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi. Our guest is Paul McCusker. And Paul, we've uh, I've interrupted you rudely in the middle of your journey. <laughs> it left you in England. Uh, but my question was, you're, you're, you're writing when you're over there, right? You're, yes, I'm freelancing, still working with Focus on the Family okay. and working a lot, variety of freelance projects with Focus and uh, on my own. And uh, so I was fortunate to be able to go over. I actually worked with a sister organization over there that does pretty much in England what Focus on the Family does with America. And so it was it was great. I loved that. I loved being freelance. I worked out of my home, so I didn't have to commute into London or do anything outrageous like that. And that period of uh, time was wonderful. Uh, uh, discovering Anglicanism was wonderful because it, it broadened so much of my understanding of history, 
at least going back 500 years, because that's the main thing is it takes you back to a certain point. And as I was exploring, well, what do you believe and why do you believe it? And tying that into scripture, but then uh, growing in an appreciation of tradition, growing into going beyond just that very literal in the Bible, not in the Bible, not in the Bible, forget it. I began to have a sort of a growing awareness of uh, the authority of the church in terms of establishing its doctrine. And I was, that even was, say, to I was even going to say that from a writer's standpoint, the, the English roots of evangelicalism. Mm -hmm. In America, we could see Billy Graham, or we could go back to uh, you know Moody and and uh, Jonathan Edwards. We see all mm -hmm. that stream coming through through Princeton and all of that. But now all of a sudden you jump because C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, and you've got all those great roots from England mm -hmm. and uh, G.I. Packer and, and, and all that wonderful intervarsity background that really has fed so much of American evangelicalism. And the, and the sensibility of that. Uh, I, I want to say it's a gentler sensibility to some degree. It's kind of hard to describe. It's, it's just very different from the American version of that. And that resonated with mm -hmm. me. So I loved the liturgy. I, I loved what it, without knowing that a lot of what they were teaching me was Catholic. Because yeah. the, the wonderful thing about Anglicanism, as I understood it then, was that it was a great synthesis Unlike uh, the, the, the groups that threw out anything that looked like Catholicism, um, the, the British are wonderful synthesizers. Mm. So they essentially took the stuff that they still felt comfortable with from the Catholic reality, the first 1500 years, and then brought that together with the reform sensibilities that were yeah. pervasive in Europe and all around. And uh, I, I was learning about Catholicism without realizing I was learning about Catholicism. And so certain things became real to me, the communion of the saints, the, yeah. the sense of, of God at work in history, and still a love of scripture, still a, a love of theology, not as a flighty thing, but as a very real thing. And Anglican theology at its core uh, was very attractive to me. Uh, what I didn't realize was how quickly Anglicanism was beginning to abandon its own theology, yeah. especially in this country. Well, as you enter into, you've gone from Baptist in the, your childhood into the California, which was very much of individualistic mm -hmm. evangelicalism, uh, into the Anglican, which is this, as you said, not different. All Anglicans ain't the same. So, I mean, right. could, but but you know, the the thread of Anglicanism you were, was, was preserving a great tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, where was the thread of authority to determine which of these things you were believing was true? Mm -hmm. Did that issue come up for you? During well, it, that? it was, and I started to realize the integration of sort of my individual, uh, personal relationship with Christ in the context of community but not so much community now as I understood it as a Baptist, which was your local church, mm -hmm. my local church and its authority through the pastor and deacons and that sort of thing. But now in a much broader sense, uh, embracing the idea that you have a church that's part of a bigger thing, yeah. uh, the Anglican church, and what that means, and then my place within that. So that was revelatory to me too. It was gentle. I didn't have a mm -hmm. sudden wake up and realize, but it was part of that. Now, we were in England for just a year, and Focus on the Family asked me to return to America. They had moved from California to Colorado. And um, we thought it through and made the decision that, for various reasons, we would. And uh, so we came back, and then we went into the now another church hunting thing, <laughs> because my big concern was that the Episcopal Church in America was sort of notoriously liberal, as, as a former Baptist might see it. And uh, so we began to look, again, trying different churches, and I just kept going back to my yearning for that liturgy, mm -hmm. for something more than trendy. And uh, fortunately, someone at, at the office had said, well, if that's what you're looking for, there's this church downtown that you really ought to go to. They're solid, good people, and uh, not like a lot of what you are hearing is happening in, in the broader Episcopal Church. And we went, and it was, in a beautiful building, aesthetically, aesthetics are important to me. Yeah. Aesthetically, a beautiful built, a church built in the 1920s, reverent. Now, I didn't even clock this for years. They had a Mary, a Marian chapel. <laughs> it was an Anglo Catholic community when the church was built. And now it was more evangelical as we went there, but it was 
everything that I, it was more Anglican than most in Church of England churches. Uh, and it's theology, it's teaching, it's very intelligent. And for years, that's where we were. And I was very happy and contented there. Uh, we even moved back to England uh, for three years. My son was born there. We were there from 97 to 2000. And, uh, and that's where I realized how uh, fractured Anglicanism was becoming through the different streams, through it, the uh, evangelical and more liberal and just orthodox, but not necessarily evangelical, that sort of thing. And that's when I realized the church in America was more Anglican than most. In your work with Focus on the Family, in your other writing, it wasn't so much Baptist or these independent groups or Anglicanism. It really no. was an evangelicalism. Yes. That was the thread that, f that continues to feed our Lord Jesus Christ, surrendered to Christ, uh, the infallibility of the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And we deal with, in most of my writing through Adventures and Odyssey, focus on the family because their emphasis is on family. It's, it's Christian based, right. inherently Protestant, but it's about what C.S. Lewis would have called mere Christianity. Yeah. In my writing for Odyssey and for radio theater and my own writing tends to apply broadly in uh, a mere Christian sort of realm. What are the essentials of the faith? Rather than get specifically denominational, that sort of thing. So oh. my writing, while it's, while it's impacted by what's going on in my life and what I'm reading and the ideas that I'm having that's infusing back in, nothing overt. I think people would be hard pressed to see anything obvious. It would in be that. a conservative understanding of scripture. Yes. You know, pro-life. Uh, you would still run up the challenge of, let's say, the Ephesians passage about the roles in the family. You know, how do you live that out? How do you play it? Because right. different evangelical groups have a different interpretation of, of the Ephesians mm -hmm. passages. Uh, but generally, not denominational. Right. Still, for focus and for that group. Yes. So now, I identified myself as Anglican and was very pleased to do that, which did put me a little bit at odds, and I don't mean in an antagonistic way, it just made me a little bit of an odd duck in the context where I work, because most were in either, you know, non-denominational or Baptist or uh, very straightforward evangelical experiences, and then I'm off to the side with this liturgical thing. That's, I was wondering if, if around the, the coffee table once in a while, because I remember when I was in evangelical seminary, Gordon Conwell, uh, we got along fine until we sat down with a cup of coffee and a piece of pie, right. and all of a sudden we're asking, well, what is the importance of baptism? Or what's the, what yes. does the Lord's Supper mean? Or what does ordination mean? I mean, those are the questions. Or that what is worship? Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. the, the center point of evangelicalism is basically opening the Bible and preaching the Word. Everything is geared towards that moment. And what I learned as an Anglican was, well, wait a minute, no, there's actually uh, deeper into tradition is another thing, and it's called communion. Uh, it's the Eucharist. It's, it's communion as the Anglican Church yeah. teaches it, which is pretty much a uh, symbol. But um, everything is geared towards that encounter with Christ, not the preaching of the Word. The preaching of the Word is on the way to the encounter at the altar. And that was new to me. But again, I understood it in its context. And, and so we didn't have big arguments about it. In fact, I think most people just said, oh, well, that's just how, that's his worship style. He likes that <laughs> liturgical stuff. Um, but basically, uh, I was Anglican for 15 years oh. plus, and it was a very rich time. But then uh, in the early 21st century, we, we, well, we had moved back. Focus asked me to come back again, and so we moved back to Colorado Springs. And uh, the Episcopal Church began to implode uh, around right. issues of sexuality and all of these things. And the key part of that for me, and the critical turning point, there were two of them, one was I realized you had people with equal authority, very intelligent, and bishops in the church in two different positions on Scripture. And I began to think, all right, now wait a minute, the issue isn't Scripture, but it's who has the authority to interpret Scripture and establish doctrine? Because all of this fractured, everybody having their own opinion is fine, but that's not what a church is meant to be. And so who has the authority to do that? And I thought, I'm going to find out. And I'm now going to go back beyond the 500-year point. And I began to move back into the early church. I wanted to know, what did the Bible say about that? What did the generation after uh, the first Christians believe by way of authority, interpretation of Scripture, and all of that? 
And so I began a gentle journey. I wasn't out to become anything else. I wasn't out to leave my Anglican experience. Uh, I was actually thinking, I'm, I'm in the fight till the end, whatever the end yeah. is going to be. But that question stayed with me, and there was that experience. And then I was at a C.S. Lewis conference in Austin, Texas, and Peter Kraft was speaking on the 10 things to learn about evil from Tolkien. And he was wonderful. Yeah. And I met him at the break, and I went up and learned that he had become a Catholic while he was attending Calvin College years before. Right. And here's where I show my bigotry. And all I can call it is bigotry. <laughs> because at that moment, I knew he was teaching philosophy at, you know, in Boston. And this is a man who knows his stuff. And my thought was, how could a man this smart be a Catholic? And rather than stop there, which I might have done years before, and say, well, it's everyone in his own taste. Maybe he just, I don't know, doesn't matter. I actually stopped and thought, what is he seeing that I'm not seeing? And if I'm going to go back and explore the ancient church to answer the one question, I suddenly realized I was going to have to put aside some prejudices. And for me, that was, I now need to put aside pretty much everything every well-meaning Protestant ever told me about the ancient church and Catholicism. And I also need to put aside all the misrepresentations I saw from Catholics. I said, I'm going to just put these two groups aside and I'm going to go in in a sort of a pure way as best as I can to investigate and figure out what in the world the early church believed and why they believed it. And so over the next five or six years, uh, that's what I was doing. I, I, it was a very gentle thing. I, again, I had no intention of being Catholic. I had no intention of being Orthodox. I was investigating both uh, at, at the same time. Well, as far as you and, knew, what you would discover was strength in where you already are. Right. And it might reinforce some of my ideas about what the church ought to be or yeah. what maybe the way forward for my Anglicanism might be. But making a huge change was not part of the equation for me. And during that time, I talked to a wonderful Orthodox priest. And then I, I came into relationship with some Catholic priests who really captured for me the essence mm -hmm. of what it was to be Catholic. And I mean, by experientially. I could do all the reading, but to see it actually played out in someone's life meant a lot to me. And uh, so that began to move, and uh, I became a very, well, I had been friends for years with Dan Burke, yeah. um, who you know. Yeah. And uh, Dan and I were on parallel journeys, and, uh, and he was a huge help and influence during this time. And finally got to a point, I, I think John Henry Newman says that there's usually a million reasons why someone will become Catholic, but usually one catalyst. And uh, basically the church we were attending, the Episcopal Church, split. Yeah. Now, I'd never experienced a church split before, but it was pretty much between the traditional Orthodox group and the group that wanted to split off now and the group that wanted to stay part of the Episcopal uh, uh, community. And I looked and said, I can't go with either. It's now changed. I had moved from if I become Catholic to when I become Catholic. And when that split happened, that I was done. There was really no reason to stay and fight for something I was no longer sure about, and I thought it's time to make this transition. Our guest is Paul McCusker. Um, to simplify uh, things, a couple of questions, Paul. What would you say is the, was the biggest hurdle to make the step from well, that long tradition of your own into the Catholic Church? Well. To be honest, there wasn't one, and, I, and I, was, uh, I have to say that as I explored the early church, my conclusion was the authority to interpret scripture and establish doctrine was in the hands of the apostles. I was convinced without question that it was apostolic authority that Christ had given the disciples and then they passed on. Then it was a question, well, who's carrying that on? Yeah. Who has apostolic authority really? That then led me 
to Catholicism. Now, unlike a lot of people that I talk to who have their shopping list of, boy, I could accept this, but this thing about Mary is making me crazy, or I can accept this, but I'm not sure about baptism or purgatory or whatever. Maybe I'm, I'm just, I'm not a very smart person. And my conclusion was, if it has apostolic authority given to it by Christ, then I'm not here to shop around and pick and choose what I believe and I don't believe. It's either the truth and yeah. the apostles pass that on or it's not. And that was simple for me. So I was reckless in a way, willing to step into that. Forget the hurdle. Once it was uh, apostolic authority, I went, well, okay. And if this is the church and they're teaching it, it's not for me to pick and choose what Christ handed by way of his authority to the apostles. Well, well it certainly wasn't that you weren't smart, as you, as you said a moment ago. It was that you were actually, a, through the gift of grace, that you'd done the very thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, the very thing, that, because we have a scripture sitting right here in front of us, is because behind it was an authority mm -hmm. to determine which book should be in this canon. It right. was, and once you understand that authority and why there's an authority there, then, then you can walk away from that and trust that there is a trinity. Apart from the authority, you can't be confident that the Trinity is a good description of God. Mm -hmm. And in those independent exactly. churches that you were talking about in the, on the way over on the West Coast, I mean, one church might have the Trinity, one, one might not, and their interpretation of it because mm -hmm. the authority had been, had been set aside. Exactly. And, and, that, and that's the, the, the remarkable thing, because some, you have to start with basic assumptions. As a Baptist or as a Protestant, there are a lot of assumptions at work that you don't challenge because you believe in the credibility or of the one who said, well, this is what we believe and why we believe it. And whether that's the reformers or whoever it was, yeah. there's a point where you go, well, somebody smarter than I am can figure that out. I don't need to worry about it. But of course, internally within Scripture, all those problematic verses where, where Jesus says things that just don't line up with the Reformed or an evangelical view. And they call them the hard verses of Jesus, the hard sayings of Jesus. Well, they're only hard because they don't line up. Well, suddenly I'm looking and saying, well, wait a minute, but they do line up from the Catholic view. The apostolic view actually brings it all together in a very coherent and holistic way. It's not this versus that. It's all bundled together and it now makes sense. So the idea of the authority behind the authority, which is let's agree on the authoritative nature of Scripture. Well, again, I think John Henry Newman had said that the reason why the reformers could not use history to aid their case was because history didn't sustain it. They had to go to just me and my Bible. Now, I think they'd be horrified by the extreme of that as we see it now, yeah. where you have um, me and my Bible and church and baptism, any of the sacraments, any of sacraments as they might be known by Protestants, are optional extras now. I know a mm -hmm. lot of evangelicals who don't even go to church anymore. It's, it's irrelevant yeah. to them because they have their Bible. And if you follow yeah. the natural extreme of that, it makes perfect sense that that's where they would wind if, up. If we went back just two generations from us, mm -hmm. our grandparents, if they had been born Methodist, would stay Methodist the rest of their life. They believed in their church right. communion, Presbyterian, Baptist, Assembly of God, Church of Christ. And then slowly it moved to when well, you go to New Town, well, let's try something new to where it doesn't matter mm -hmm. any more. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that is the rampant thing. So I wound up, um, I was received in within a year after, uh, after that. I, I, we made the move. Um, my wife uh, came with me, though okay. she had not been on the journey with me. So embracing this was more difficult for her. Uh, yet she, uh, being a wonderful mother, said, well, we agreed that it was not good for the kids to be fractured between us that or, or to go to two different churches and she had no interest in going back to what we would call a typical evangelical church but she also understood the problems with the anglican reality so she agreed to go with me even though she was not ready to become catholic and we agreed that the kids would be raised catholic as well they were young enough that we said we just don't want to give them mixed messages and so uh, we have been attending ever since. It's been six, seven okay. years now, uh, with varying degrees of um, experience uh, <laughs> in, in the churches. But uh, 
uh, it's been an amazing, um, remarkable time for me on very uh, deep levels. There was a litany of things that non-Catholic Christians believe about the church mm. uh, that keep them away from the church, mm -hmm. barriers to the church. Often they're pointing at bad Catholics, mm -hmm. this long list of things. Now from this side of the pond, mm -hmm. how do you address those? Well, it's, it's funny because uh, the, the thing that I encourage uh, my evangelical friends, the first thing you've got to get on the other side of is the fact that it's foreign to you. And as someone who has traveled yeah. overseas, you have two attitudes you can have when you enter a foreign country. One is you can say, well, that's stupid. Why do they do that? <laughs> or you can say, well, that's different. Why do they do that? And I said, first thing is to get rid of the mis misinformation. The impressions you have of what Catholics believe are probably not accurate. It's been filtered through a number of different things that may or may not have anything to do with the truth. And when you encounter that, you have to make your choice. Are you going to go, well, that's stupid and reject it? Or are you going to at least give it a chance, even if you ultimately disagree with it? Even if you ultimately yeah. say, OK, I now understand why you believe what you believe, but I don't agree. Great. At least you're disagreeing with the real thing as opposed to like an urban legend of it. And that, to me, was a critical part of it. You, you go to your Baptist church that you grew up in, and everything in that building, the history of everything in that building, doesn't go back very far. Right. 1967. The, the independent <laughs> churches in California, same thing. Right. But you walk into that Catholic church in Southern California you talked about, mm -hmm. and what you saw there was, you almost, museum is the wrong word, of course. Right. But yet, what you have here is the traditions of Polish, of mm -hmm. Germans, of French, of Spanish, of uh, Czechos, for all this have been brought with the immigration into our wonderful churches. Mm -hmm. So those coming from the outside have to recognize you're seeing from the, before you even enter into a Catholic church, you're seeing great uh, traditions that mean a, a tremendous amount to the people right. that connect them. Right. To and, their heritage. And our reaction to that can be, well, I'm an American and, you know, it goes back 50 years and that's all I need. Or you can um, move into this stream of history. And that was the thing that struck me about it. It's moving into a continuity that goes all the way back to Christ himself. And in doing that, uh, I become part of it. It's not me in my Bible. It's now me with personal faith moving into that bigger community of faith, the immediate community, but that community as part of a much bigger reality that is history, God at work in history itself. And that's what the Catholic Church brings to it in all the deeper meanings of, of the liturgy. Everything that's going on has deep, deep meaning. The great travesty to me as someone who's become Catholic, and Peter Kreeft actually said this, uh, that the great scandal in the Catholic Church is not the obvious scandal. It's the fact that Catholics do not know what they believe and why they believe it. Yeah. And moving into that, uh, I actually found it heartbreaking that I'm actually coming in as the new guy, having conversations with cradle Catholics who didn't realize something that I had just recently yeah. learned. The and, treasure and that it was they have and don't just, often appreciate. And it's right there. It's right there, but they're not accessing it. Well, let's say there's someone listening that's an evangelical and wondering, you know, should I make the same move? What's your words to them? Well, my words would be, um, first thing I would say, well, check your motive. What is it? Uh, I, it's, I don't think it's good enough. Maybe God can use this. I didn't become Catholic in defiance of being Anglican. I didn't become Anglican because I was rejecting being a Baptist. For me, there's a, a follow through yeah. that goes from one building on the other building on the other. And um, my concern for, for example, a lot of Anglicans is that they're so fed up with a lot of things going on, they become Catholic. They kind of jump over to this one just because, not because they've fully embraced it, but because they were rejecting what came before. And I, I think it's very important to embrace the church because God compels you to embrace it as the fullness of the truth, as a matter of grace, as a matter of relationship, not to do it as a reaction to something, 
but because of what it is and you want to become uh, joined with yeah. that. And the That's core. a starting point. And then find out truly what the church believes and why they believe it. And be very careful what you hear from other people because very often, especially well-meaning Protestants, really don't know. Yeah. They've heard a distortion of a distortion or have seen a distortion of it in perhaps some Catholic lives or whatever. So start with a clean slate. Well, and the beauty of in our lifetime, we've been given the catechism, mm -hmm. which there it is. It's beautiful and a beautifully written document. Right. It's right there. Mm -hmm. oh, it's all together. Paul, thank you very thank you. much for sharing with us. My pleasure. Um, PaulMcCusker.com if you want to find out more about what Paul does. Thank mm -hmm. you for your writing and for your witness. And uh, you know, what a great privilege to have you here on the program mm -hmm. with us. And thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I hope Paul's journey has been an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you.